Uh, just to get one thing out of the way, uh, since I've been asked, I was not in a fight. My face is a bit swollen. I ha- it's not very exciting. I have like an infected gland or something. So I know I look deformed, but I'm feeling quite fine. Thank you. <laughs> Let's pray and ask God to speak to us through his word. God, as we sang, your word is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. So we ask you to guide us now as we open it. Speak to us. Pray in Jesus' name. The name, the living word. Amen. Uh, this past summer, some of you might have been a part of this. We had out in, the, uh, in our West campus here on this lot, a uh, Compassion International event where people could come and um, experience. You walk through with headsets and you could pick one of three children and sort of experience a bit of their life in different parts of the world and sponsor a child if you so chose. My family did that together and we sponsor a child now. His name is uh, Sawadogo Umaru. He lives in Burkina Faso in Africa. My kids have written letters to him and we support his schooling and and, uh, and it's a good thing for us. And so, and you've probably seen, if not Compassion International, like the, at our church, I'm, sh- I'm sure you've seen on television the commercials for starving children and the need for feeding them. And, and it, it can move your heart when you see children suffering with hunger, the most basic needs. When economists tell us there's more than enough food and resources in our world to meet all the needs of the hungry people. It's not as if our culture, you know, in our world, we're just, there's a shortage. We just have so much trouble getting it to them. We're so out of balance and excess and so forth, and, and, and we, we lack sometimes compassion or, or infrastructure to get the resources to those in need. And it is tragic when you think about it that way. When I was thinking about this sermon, it dawned on me, that's not only true physically. There are so many people in our world, all over this world, who are starving for spiritual truth. They don't even know it. And for some reason, we just can't get it to them. We have trouble getting it to them. Perhaps sometimes that's because we have trouble getting it into us. We're in a series called The Way of Delight, looking at Psalm 119 for the the last, for five weeks long, the next couple weeks we have left. The longest chapter in the longest book of the Bible. Dedicated, this chapter is, solely to the Word of God. Out of its 176 verses, 171 of them have a direct reference to the Word of God. Word, commands, laws, precepts testimonies, decrees, all these things refer to God's word. The Psalms are dedicated to praising God. Psalm 119 is dedicated to praising God for and through his word. The more I have studied and read God's word, the more convinced I am than ever, more passionate I am, that it's absolutely true, that it is the words of life, and it has the power to change lives, that nothing else does. There are many, I think far too many, professing Christians today, even in our church, certainly in the church in America, that would say they intellectually, if you ask them the question, do you believe God's word is true, they would say yes. Perhaps that describes many of you. I hope so. There are many in our church, in the churches today, that would say, if you ask them the question, do you believe God's word has authority in your life? Yes, I do. Do you believe it's without error? Yes, I do. Do you believe it's inspired? Yes, I do. They would intellectually say yes to all those things, but yet it has no real place in their lives from day to day. Think about that for a minute. How is it possible that we, who claim to know and love and follow God and his son Jesus Christ, would say this is true, it's inerrant, it's inspired, but I don't really open it. But I don't know much about what's in it. But I don't, it has no place in my day to day life. It's a tragedy. It's ridiculous when you think about it, but it describes so many of us. Before we get into the the texts and the specific points of the sermon, I just want to tell you as simply and clearly as I can, you cannot know God and you cannot follow his son Jesus without this. If this has no place in your life, you are kidding yourself if you say, I know who God is and I follow Christ, but this has no place in your life. It's impossible. It's impossible. This is how you know God. This is how you follow Christ. Yes, of course, God can and does use people and relationships and circumstances and experiences to teach us and to guide us. Of course he does that. But it's his word that tells us what he's up to in those people and relationships and circumstances and experiences. Many of us turn to God's word for guidance like the song we heard sung, a lamp to my feet, a light to my path. Many of us turn to God's word for, for light and guidance when? 
if at all. When do, we turn, when do most people turn there? When things are smooth sailing? In crisis. When, when trouble hits. When we come to the end of all of our resources. I need something here. Maybe I'll, maybe I'll check God's word. You know the flip and point method? Have you ever tried that? Flip the Bible point. What does it say? Like the man who tried that method because he was at a loss for what to do in his life and he flipped and pointed and it said, and he read the verse, Judas went out and hanged himself. He thought, well, that cannot be what God wants. He tried it again, flipped and pointed, and he said, and it was the verse, and he said, go thou and do likewise. Well, that, I, I'm obviously wrong. He tried again a third time, pointed, and it said, what thou must do, do us quickly. That's humorous. A little, it's a little bit, but that, that's not the kind of guidance that God's word offers us. Open your Bibles if you have them to Psalm 119, verses 105. Excuse me, before we get there. Our theme verse, I forgot to mention this, our memory verse for the series. Some of you uh, have said this. It's verse 16, 119, verse 16. I will delight in your statutes. I will not forget your word or neglect your word. I will delight in your decrees. I will not neglect your word. I was in Target two weeks ago uh, doing some shopping, and I heard a voice this is, I'm not making this up. I know when a pastor says I'm not making this up, it sounds like, well, do you normally make things up? No. Uh, anyway, <laughs> all right. So I'm in Target with my shopping cart, and I hear a voice from the other aisle call out, I delight in your decrees. I will not neglect your word. And I started laughing. Somebody in our church was messing with me from one aisle over, calling out the memory verse. <laughs> but at least they're memorizing it. That is our memory verse for the series. And if you have uh, your Bible, then Psalm 119, verse 105 and 130. Verse 105 reads, Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. That sounds familiar, doesn't it? 130. The unfolding of your words gives light. It imparts understanding to the simple. The kind of guidance God's word offers is not the kind where you flip and point when, things are, when you're in the middle of a crisis. Now, I'm not saying you shouldn't turn to God's word in crisis. Of course, you should. I'm not saying there aren't answers and there's not guidance in crisis. Of course, there is. I'm saying if that's the only time you ever open God's word, that you don't understand him, and you lack the true depth, wisdom, and guidance that God's word really offers you, the wisdom and guidance of God's word is that which comes from time spent reading, studying, reflected, reflecting, discussing, and praying it through. It's the man or woman who's in God's word regularly when things are smooth that is most likely to find guidance from it when things are rough. Now I get teased around here often about quoting or referring to a particular author. Some of you know who that is, C.S. Lewis. And it's not like I go back to my office and have a quote book, although there is a book called The Quotable Lewis, and you could buy that, that's, not, that's another story. It's not like I go look up quotes to use, what did Lewis say? It's the fact that I've spent so much time reading, studying, not only Lewis's writings, but reading those who've written about his writings, that I sort of can't help it. Lewis makes his way into my thoughts on his own. I can't help thinking, oh, this connects with something I read in Lewis. And so it just comes in of its own accord. By the way, Lewis talked way about Aslan. He said he came bounding in to the Narnian stories of his own accord. This convicted me when I thought about this. We ought to be that way with the word of God. We ought to be the kind of people who spend so much time reading, studying, thinking about what it says, that we sort of can't help making connections. Oh, this connects to that. I remember reading this in God's word. Too few of us are like that. Myself included at times. But that's what God wants for us. That's his desire for us. We do not read or study the Bible to become Bible scholars, of course. We read and study to know God, to know him through his word. My favorite verse, I've been studying Psalm 119 for several weeks now, reading it through and, uh, and, and reflecting on it. My favorite verse is verse 18. The psalmist writes, Open my eyes that I may behold wondrous things out of your law. Simple, clear, deeply profound prayer. Open my eyes that I may behold wondrous things out of your law. This simple prayer holds profound truth for those who desire to discover and to know who God is through his word. First, a couple implications in this prayer. By the way, all of Psalm 119 is a prayer, praising God for his word, asking God to use his word in our lives. The first implication is that you must read with a desire to see. 
You must read with a desire to see something. When I was dating Erin, who's now my wife, I spent a summer before our engagement away from her when I was, well, at a failed attempt to play professional football for one thing, but then uh, and I was working at a, a, a sports camp for the summer. And she would write letters to me. I would write to her, but my letters were less frequent and shorter. And she would write these long letters to me. I kept them in a box. I still have them in a tin box. And I would pull them out from time to time in, the, in that summer, working as a camp counselor in the sports camp, and reread her letters. Over and over again, I would read them. She's a great writer, but why did I do that? At a certain point, I've got all the information there is to get out of them. I think I understand the details. This is when the Chicago Bulls were in their championship run, so she would send newspaper clippings, and she would write things about that, and then she would write things that I won't share with you, they're just for me, in those letters, right? <laughs> why did I read them over and over again? Fundamentally because I loved the one who wrote them to me. It was my way of reconnecting with her even though we were physically separated. I loved the one who wrote those words to me so I'd go back to them even though I could re recite them by heart. Secondly, I was, there's a part of me that was looking for maybe some little hint about her love for me or some little word of affection that maybe I'd missed, some nuance. You ever do that in a letter? That's, that's the attitude we should have when we approach the word of God because we love the one who wrote this to us. And we're looking for some word, some nuance that we might have missed, some new revelation of God's love for us or his character or his glory or his nature that we haven't seen before. The second implication of this prayer, open my eyes that I might see wonderful things out of your law, implies we should be reading to see. Second implication is quite obvious. What? If you pray and ask to have your eyes open, what does that imply? <laughs> They're like my right eye, swollen shut, right? No. They're not open at the moment. They're not open. I, in other words, it's not fully. In other words, if you ask God to help you see, you're saying by inference, I don't see. I know I don't see. I need you, God, to open my eyes to help me see. We need divine help when, we come, when it comes to reading God's word. Over 30 times in this psalm, the psalmist asks some form of, of God help me, God help me. Teach me, God, open my eyes. Verse, Psalm 119, verse 27. We'll just look at a few of them. Make me understand the way of your precepts. Make me understand, he says. Verse 29. Put false ways far from me and graciously teach me your law. Graciously teach me, he prays. Verse 34. Give me understanding that I may keep your law. Verse 36. Incline my heart to your testimonies and not to selfish gain. That's a good one. Think about that. Incline my heart. The psalmist is saying, and we all know this by experience, the natural inclination or lean of our heart is not towards God's law. It's away from it. So he prays, incline my heart. Help me to lean toward your law in my heart. Verse 66. Teach me good judgment and knowledge, for I believe in your commandments. Verse 73. Your hands have made me and fashioned me. Give me understanding that I may learn your commandments. We could go on, but we'll stop there. Over and over again, over 30 times, the psalmist asks God to teach him, to open his eyes, to incline his heart, to give him understanding. Meaning, we don't have it on our own. Our whole culture teaches us to view the, book, the word of God as a text that we stand over, right? That we master. Because that's how it is in school. You go to school, you're given a syllabus. On the syllabus are things you're going to have to know for the test, right? And you're going to have to know these books, and you're going to have to memorize facts and spit those back come exam time. Or you're going to have to synthesize things in a novel, explain connections, what the author's intent was. But you're going to have to study, memorize, and master the text for the test. That's exactly the opposite when it comes to God's Word. It is not the text we stand over. It's the text over us. We need to ask God, open my eyes, teach me, incline my heart. If God's word is confusing to you, if it's intimidating to you, if it's overwhelming to you to think about reading it, that's the place to begin. Begin praying the words of Psalm 119. Teach me, God. Give me understanding, God. Incline my heart, God. Start with small sections and pray that God will open your eyes. The point is, God does. One of my favorite little sections here is verse 97 through 100. I'll read it for you. You can follow along with me. Psalm 119, verse 97. Oh, how I love your law. It is my meditation all the day. 
Your commandment makes me wiser than my enemies, for it is ever with me. I have more understanding than all my teachers, for your testimonies are my meditation. I understand more than the aged, for I keep your precepts. This is one you should, if you have teenagers at home, you should show it to them, right? Who doesn't want to be wiser than their teachers? Who doesn't want to be, have more understanding than the aged? But it's not talking about book learning or experience. It's talking about divine wisdom. It reminds me of Luke chapter 2. Do you remember the story of the boy Jesus in the temple? He's uh, with his family. He's 12 years old. They go there for Passover. And uh, then they travel out afterwards at Passover. And they're in like a caravan. Mary and Joseph and all their relatives are traveling out with all the cousins and nieces and nephews. And they get a day's journey outside the city. And they camp for the night. And suddenly they can't find Jesus. I thought you had him. I thought he was with you. He wasn't with Cousin Billy. I thought he was Uncle Fred. We don't have him, right? I left my son at a bowling alley in Wheaton on New Year's Eve one time. But that's another story. He's 13 and doing fine now. He was seven at the time. I'll tell you that story some other time. So it can happen, right? To Mary and Joseph and to me at least. Anyway, they go back to the city to find Jesus, the boy. Where do they find him? In the temple. What's he doing? Teaching. Asking questions. The text says, in verse 46, Luke 2, 46 through 47, they were amazed at his questions and his answers for a 12-year-old. More understanding than the aged. More wisdom than all his teachers. That doesn't come from books and, and learning and experience. It comes from the Word of God. A wisdom beyond what this world offers. Beyond the philosophy of this age. The point is, God opens the eyes of the blind to see the glory of God in his Word. God has ordained that his eye-opening work of his spirit is combined with the mind-informing or opening work of his word. Spirit and word go together. And it's not insignificant that all of Psalm 119 is a prayer. We must not make the mistake of thinking that what we really need is new information. What we need is not... new information. What we need is new eyes to see the information God has already laid in front of us. Open my eyes that I might see wonderful things out of your word. I talk to people from time to time in our church and they'll say things to me like, well, I'm really looking for deeper teaching. Have you ever heard that or said that perhaps? Often what they mean by that is stuff I haven't heard before. I want to hear something new. Ah, I've heard that before. And there's not, I'm not saying there's nothing new. There's always more. But fundamentally, our deepest need as followers of Christ in this world is not stuff that it's new, we've never heard before. It's to have eyes to see what's right in front of us. To take seriously that which we have heard before. To let it penetrate our hearts. To let it change our lives. Psalm 119 is a prayer. So I just want to, this might sound a little bit on the simplistic side. I want to give you three, three convictions or three things we can do as we come to the word of God that involve pray. D.L. Moody said, the only way to keep a broken vessel full is to keep the faucet turned on. I love that line. We're all broken vessels, the the scripture teaches us. We're not perfect. We leak, spiritually speaking. So the only way to keep our hearts full is to have the faucet turned on. What does that mean? That the word of God will be pouring into our lives continually. If the last time you memorized a verse was back in vacation Bible school or when you were a little girl or a little boy, you can remember little fragments of it, that's not enough. You've been leaking since then. You need to have the faucet turned on and to be filled up with what God's word says to you. John Bailey, a Puritan pastor and theologian, writes this prayer. I've always appreciated it. He says, "Oh, Oh, you who are the source and ground of all truth, guide me today, I beseech you. Who doesn't like to say the word beseech? In my hours of reading, give me wisdom to abstain as well as to persevere. Let the Bible have its proper place and grant that as I read, I may be alive to the stirrings of your spirit in my soul. What a great prayer. Guide me, teach me when to stop, when to start, and make me attentive to what you're saying to me all the time. That's what the psalmist prays. Open my eyes, O Lord, that I may behold wondrous things out of your law. So the first conviction is to pray and read. It sounds simple, I know. Pray and read. What a privilege. The Apostle Paul writes this in Ephesians 3, uh, verses 3 and 4 in Ephesians. The Apostle Paul writes these words. How the mystery was made known to me by revelation. Paul saying, God's rev- God revealed his mystery, his gospel, to him, and he wrote it down. I have written briefly. 
And then the next verse, verse 4. When you read this, you can perceive my insight into the mystery of Christ. What does that tell us? Paul said, God spoke to me. I wrote it down. And when you read it, you'll perceive that. You'll see that. You'll have eyes to see it. What God is saying. Pray and read that our eyes would be opened. God will the greatest mysteries of life be revealed to us through reading. In chapter 1, verse 18 of Ephesians, the Apostle Paul says, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened. Well, if our hearts have eyes, right? The eyes of your heart may be enlightened. And to what? That we may comprehend how high and long and wide and deep is the love of Christ. Second thing, pray and think. Pray and think. 2 Timothy 2, verse 15. Be diligent or study to present yourselves approved to workmen as a, God, as, a, as a workman to God who does not need to be ashamed, accurately handling the word of truth. God gave us a book about himself, not so that we might read it in any old careless way, but that we might think, think deeply about what it says. Proverbs 2, verses 1 through 6 says, My son, if you will receive my words and treasure my commandments within you, make your ear attentive to wisdom, incline your heart to understanding. For if you cry for discernment, lift your voice. If you seek her as silver and search for her as hidden treasures, then you will discern the fear of the Lord. Pray and think also, 2 Timothy 2, verse 7. The New American Standard says, Consider what I say. New, New International Version says, Think about it. Literally, it means think about what I'm saying to you. <laughs> when I was a little kid, my mother, when I was in trouble, used to say, Jeffrey, I want you to go in the corner and think about what you just did. Think about what I just told you. Oh, what kid does that? Oh, okay. You go in the corner. Um, what did she say? You're just thinking, how long is this going to last, right? The Word of God says to us, when we read, don't just read blindly. Don't just read to get through the motions because you check off your reading for the day. A couple, well, more than a decade ago, actually, I tried to hold for a couple of years to a reading schedule by Robert Murray McShane, an old Scottish Presbyterian minister. And it would, would put you through the New Testament four times, the Psalms six times, and the Old Testament three times in a year. It's a ridiculous amount of reading. And all I felt was guilty all the time for being behind in my reading. So I was just reading, I was retaining nothing. Like, do you remember story problems when you were a kid in school? I have bad dreams still about story problems. Like if a train leaving for New York is traveling at 100 miles an hour and there's a thousand apples on the train, or I don't know what, ah, right? You don't even know what you're reading after a while. You just read it, like I can't remember. What I, it, it, sometimes we approach the word of God like that. Like, oh, I don't know what it says, but at least I read those verses and I can say I did. Pray and read. Pray and think. Read and think when you come to the word of God. Read short sections. Stop. Think. What is God saying to me here? What does he want me to do with this? How does this connect with what else I've read in his word? Ask questions. Jot, one of the best things you can do is if you like to write your Bible, fine. If not, get a notebook and, and write down chapter and verse of things you don't understand. That puts you on the path of understanding. Start calling, texting, emailing, reading those who do. Your understanding will grow. If you're praying, God, open my eyes that I might behold wonderful things out of your law. Finally, pray and speak. Pray and read, pray and think, pray and speak. This might sound simple, but it's so important. Do you realize that the Word of God, if you have your Bible, I want you to put it in your hands, if you have it with you. If you don't, your phone doesn't count. <laughs> oh, I know, because you were texting anyway. No, <laughs> I'm kidding, I don't know that. What you hold in your hands, what we have in the Word of God, is it was intended to be spoken. These are letters. C.S. Lewis said about the Psalms, they're poems written to be sung out loud together. The New Testament, most of it are letters Paul wrote to people who were, many of them were illiterate or didn't, weren't all going to have a copy. They weren't distributing copies like we have this before the printing press. Somebody would stand and read this out loud. Or prophecies meant to be read out loud, declared to God's people. All of what we have in the Word of God is meant to be spoken, not just read in private. We're such an individualistic society that our reading is like, we call it the quiet time, right? The evangelical quiet time. It sounds like, like a time out, like you're in trouble, right? Go have your quiet time with God, right? right? And there's nothing wrong with private reading. I do a lot of it. It's a rich and wonderful thing. But the Word of God is also meant to be spoken. When I was in college... I was a freshman at Wheaton College. I was a complete meathead jock. I was not the refined individual you see standing before you today. Right? I was in a small group. The leader of that small group was the quarterback of the team, a guy named Ben. 
he took an interest in me. He saw that I was pretty dedicated to training physically to become a great football player. That's what I was my goal at the time. But I wasn't that serious about training myself spiritually. He wrote down a verse on a card, 1 Timothy 4, 8. He folded it up and he handed it to me and he said, Jeff, I've been praying for you. And he says, this is for you. He handed me the card and he quoted the verse to me. For physical training is of some value, but godliness has value in all things, holding promise for both this life and the life to come. I've never forgotten that. Ben, the quarterback and my small group leader, spoke the word of God to me. He'd read it. He thought about it. It occurred to him, this is not only for me, but I know a young man who needs this. And he gave it to me. And he spoke it to me. You have no idea the power of God's word when it's spoken to somebody, into their life. Perhaps you've known it in your own life. The word of God tells us it's living and active, sharper than a double-edged sword. We need to read it pray when we do, think about what it says, and speak it to each other. You ever do that? You ever come across a passage of God's word and think, I know somebody who needs this right now. A word of encouragement, a word of challenge, a word of comfort, a word of conviction. Don't, don't set that aside. That is the spirit of God. Open my eyes that I might behold wonderful things out of your law, and when I do, I want to speak them. I want to speak them in praise and have my brothers and sisters join me. I want to speak them to somebody's life because God might be using me to speak his living word. I think we miss that. It's not just to get more information. It's to speak it to each other. Close by reading to you a couple of stanzas from one of my favorite hymns. May the mind of Christ my Savior live in me from day to day. By his love and power controlling all I do and say. May the word of God dwell richly in my heart from hour to hour, so that all may see I triumph only through his power. May the peace of God my Father rule my life in everything, that I may be calm to comfort the sick and sorrowing. May I run the race before me, strong and brave to face the foe, looking only unto Jesus as I onward go. Men and women of God, you have been given the word of God, and you cannot know him, and you cannot follow his son without this in your life. Let's pray. God, we thank you for your word, for its power. We confess to you that sometimes we are ignorant of it. Sometimes we are downright resistant to it. We ask for your forgiveness. We ask you to break our hearts of our resistance, to open our eyes, that we might indeed behold wonderful things out of your word, that you would show us your glory, your beauty, your power, your purpose through your word, that we might truly be called people of your word. We thank you, we praise you, Jesus, the living word. Amen.